Welcome back to the Global Indian Podcast, home to the greatest conversations and the official network for open and liberal minds. Because yes, let's face it, we are everywhere. Now, every week, as you know, we plunge ourselves into the human experience behind our perceptions of identity, take a second look at the countries we now call home, and tackle the big conversations. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we did a podcast looking at Inside Guyana, talking about the idea of ethnic-based politics and where the future lies. At that moment, we had a champion of sorts, Timothy Jonas, who spoke quite frankly about this. Well, it created an online storm with many conversations going back and forth in the comment section. We were then approached by the government of Guyana saying, well, Rajan, in order to have the full perspective, we need to also have the right to reply. And I'm now joined on the podcast by a wonderful minister in Guyana who kindly gave her time and expertise to kind of guide me through the other narrative of what's really shaping the idea of Guyana, the way going forward, and more importantly, hit the nail on the head on some of the key issues that many of the audience were speaking about. So without further ado, I'd like to invite my next guest, Honourable Minister Gail Texera. Now, just before I introduce her, the reason why I'm very excited here is because her background is rather remarkable. At the age of 19, she went to Canada and she was fighting against the whole apartheid regime in South Africa. She has been involved in politics for over 30 years, holding various ministerial roles from that of Minister of Youth and Sports through to her current position there as Chief Whip. She's also delivered speeches in Guyana, looking at the rise of fundamentalism for financing, but also having a look at the softer sides of where Guyana is now heading into. So it's a rather important discussion that she's taking the lead for. So Gail, lovely to have you in the show. Welcome here. It's freezing in London, but as you told me, it's nice, warm and sunny in Guyana. Um, I, I feel like we got up onto a really weird start there. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to your viewers. And, and thank you for having me on your program. And I hope the sun and warmth of Guyana will permeate the program and be able to warm you up in London, which I know uh, you're having a very cold spell. So thank you. And um happy to be on the program as a Guyanese, as a Guyanese woman, as a Guyanese politician, to be able to shed uh, a different perspective on Guyana. Absolutely. Well, I suppose the, the big question is, it's, Gail, what does it mean to be Guyanese? What is that identity? To be Guyanese is to really be proud to belong to a country, as we say, our navel string is buried here because that's our old cultural practice that when babies are born, we bury their umbilical cords, that we're tied to the land. This is an old tradition that has come to us from different parts of the world. As you know, our people came from different parts of the world as uh, exploited by the colonizers. And so we are a kaleidoscope of different ethnic groups. Uh, no one ethnic group is in majority in the sense of over 50%. So in, in other words, we're a country of minorities. Everybody is a minority in Guyana, and my group is the minority of the minority. And so the um, we are blessed as, as a country that is so diverse ethnically, so diverse with religion and a very tolerant religious country of, of different views, um, a country that is diverse geographically and absolutely beautiful, and a country of different languages, our Amerindian languages, our Creole languages, and uh, we're just very unique. We're not an island, we're mainland. So although we have uh, some of the attributes of the Caribbean countries, we're also unique because we're on the mainland of South America. We are a very unique and special people and a very hospitable people. We like to meet people and we like people to come to our country and see what it's like. And, and you're mean karaoke singers as well, from what I recall. So it's um, you've got the best of everything. Well, I, I can't, I, I'm, I don't have that attribute, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, Gail, coming into it, because I know one of the key issues that people came across when it came to Guyana, and I personally saw it as well when I went in, is we'll, we'll start at the beginning. A couple of years ago, you had the elections that took place in 2020. Yes. It was yes. one of the most heated, contested elections in the history of Guyana, because it seemed that there was a count, then there was a recount, and everybody was up in arms saying that this is ethnic-based politics. Before we get into the question of ethnicity in Guyana, what happened at that moment in time? Why was there so much discrepancy over who won the elections? As you know, the, the elections were called because there was no confidence motion in 
December uh, 2018. And according to our constitution, when a country falls, there must be an election in three months. The elections never took place until March 2020, uh, which was 14 months later. <clears throat> Whilst the elections was, you know, elections themselves were quite uh, heated, they were not violent. And the thing is that um, the crowds that turned out to the rallies were free to attend. Uh, people were not um, threatened in, in many ways. I mean, the media played an important role in some cases of hyping up and trying to create ethnic divisions. However, the elections itself, the election day itself was peaceful. All the observers from the Commonwealth, the uh, Organization of American States, United Nations, the European Union, all said it was a peaceful election. The problems came three days later, two to three days later, when the Ghana Elections Commission officials and the government tried to distort the results. Because, you know, we have statements of poll that are counted at the place of poll, those statements of poll become the results of the election that is added up, total up all over the country. So we have proof of what happened at every polling station. And so that became uh, an issue where the GCOM, the Ghana Elections Commission officials, tried to change the results coming from particularly Region 4, which was the largest region. And that, that went on into... Um, Finally, a recount, which was finished, and uh, then again, the GCOM officials refused uh, to tabulate the results, to give the correct results of the recount. That went on for almost another month. So five months, elections were delayed. And although it was a very traumatic experience to go through, and one in which, as Guyanese, we're proud of the fact that democracy prevailed, because we were on the precipice. Had the government and Ghana Elections Commission succeeded in being able to have a, a result that were totally false uh, move forward, then we would not be here today, and I certainly wouldn't be here today. The government would certainly not be here today, and that uh, the res response in Ghana would have been quite different. So that we did have a day of one day of spontaneous uh, eruption, and that was quelled by the PVPC leaders who tried to make sure that people were peaceful and we were disciplined. The people of Ghana were disciplined. We could have erupted into terrible uh, ethnic conflict or civil conflict, but it did not take place for the whole five months. And then the election results were announced. Uh, president Mohammed Irfan Ali was announced the president. The PPP civic government was installed with over 50% of the votes and uh, was a relatively uh, peaceful transition. The opposition now says that uh, we were installed, but the entire world recognized the elections, recognized the uh, results of the recount, and recognized the legitimate government of Ghana being led by President Irfan Ali. So whilst it was extraordinarily traumatic and the Guyanese went through what was a uh, a yo-yo of emotions. It, we were going by hour by hour, what was going on in GCOM, what was going on at different levels. Um, the fact and most important lesson of 2020 is that although we're a young democracy, an emerging democracy, that democracy prevailed. And the extreme duress in that period has never happened before. We've had rigged elections in from 1968 to 1992, and the the um, Granada TV has documented that by several documentaries that showed what was going on. Um, and so every election from 92 has had an observer mission because sometimes the opposition or the People's National Congress uh, are dissatisfied with the results. So the, the fact that we were able as a country to have taken ourselves, stepped back from the precipice and been able to recognize that democracy was at stake and the fundamental right to choose your government was at stake, led to people, whether they, in the majority, people voted for the PPC, for other parties, and for even a large section of those who voted for the APNU AFC coalition, prevented violence. People, I think, and, and that's a, a lesson we have to learn, despite all the talk about conflicts and, and disunity, the fact that, that we were able to come through that intact and in a country where democracy was um, preserved, it was it was protected and preserved. And what so I think those are important then, lessons as, to learn from. 
Absolutely. What would have happened then if if the voting had taken place, the recount had, had been done, and it turned out that the opposition, who the current opposition had won, would democracy still have spelt itself through? Of course, of course, of course. But you see, the difference between the UK elections and ours is that we have the 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 votes are counted at the place of poll. Yeah. And a statement of poll is uh, signed by all the polling agents and all the staff. And that that is your that is the most important document that comes out. And when those are all added up, they then you get the results. And so add the poll the statements of poll show that the app new AFC had won. Yes we'd have to accept it. The point is that that was not what was going on, was not what was going on. In Absolutely. 2011, they won, the, they, they won the elections in 2015. You have to remember that. They won the elections in 2015 by a small margin of, of less than 30,000 people. We did not go on the streets and protest and, and create violence. We accepted, although we were extraordinarily hurt and believe firmly that we something had happened in that elections, and now evidence is coming out to show that something did, but that we went to the petition the court, as is our right. And uh, between 2015 and 2020, the court never heard our petition, where the laws say that an election petition must be heard urgently and immediately. And the same GCOM officials who tried to Rob the Guyanese votes in, in 2020 are the same officials in 2015 and 2016 who uh, went to the courts to prevent our case election petition being heard and leading to what is up to now, what is seven, eight years our petition hasn't been heard, but we peacefully went forward. So we have, must remember 2015 happened. Absolutely. Hitting the nail on the head, it does Guyana have an ethnic divide? Because that's something that has come through on the comments that one political party is mainly that of an African descent and the other one of an Indian descent. Now, for me, I know what you're going to say, Gail. Have a look at both political parties. Have a look at who makes up those parties. And it is equally divided. I have enough representation from all different people on both sides of the market. But what is the ethnic divide taking place in Guyana? Because now there's allegations that there's a form of an apartheid now, you worked at the age of 19, looking at South Africa, dealing with a genuine apartheid that destroyed the livelihoods of everybody yeah. that was there, that brought people together. What is the ethnic issue of Guyana? Is it just politics? The To, to go back a bit, in, in that we have to remember, again, you know, context is important. And I saw there's a BBC program about context. And I do believe in context. And that that the, you have to remember the role of the British during the 50s and 60s in fueling ethnic divide um, to slow down our independence, actually to try to prevent it, and then eventually handing it over when Burnham was assured that he would be the prime minister. Um, so the British are very responsible for that. And ethnic politics has played its role. But I want to say this. We as people, we as a Guyanese people live together every day of all different ethnic groups. Elections becomes difficult in that, and this is mainly the People's National Congress, that the last thing they have to hold on to is race to divide us. Let me just give this, in, this point forward before I move on. And that is that no one political party in Guyana, that is the two main political parties, can get power with less than 50% of the vote, according to our constitution. And so it is the party that has the largest votes, the, the largest block of votes that becomes the government. The If we said all indo guyanese voted for the PPP, because that's the line they carry, that you know, PPP is Indo-dominated, uh, up new AFC is Afro-dominated, that if every indo guyanese voted for the PPP, that's about 43% of the population. We still can't get a government. The APNU, if all afro guyanese only voted for them, they have approximately 38% of the population. So that, and that's in counting everybody. In order to get into to, to government, we must have support, crossover votes from other ethnic groups. And the PVP has succeeded to do that from 92 to 2011, and then 2020 to now. So this view that 
this Indian dominated party, this African dominated party, and particularly with the People's Progressive Party. From our inceptions, we've always been a party that has had other ethnic groups and won support from other ethnic groups. And that has got stronger because of the, the People's Progressive Party's civic alliance, which is what is in government, which includes persons that are not PPP, but who support the programs of the People's Progressive Party. There are ethnic insecurities, obviously, because people have from time to time experienced violence, have experienced during the APNU AFC government a few years ago of firing 7,000 sugar people, sugar workers, uh, terminating, uh, terminating overnight 1,972 Amerindian community service officers. The Amerindian population, by the way, which is our indigenous population, is um, uh, almost 11% of the population of Ghana. They are a big voting bloc in terms of the two ethnic larger groups, that is indo guyanese and afro guyanese and very important in terms of our interior, etc. So that each party has to be able to have policies and programs that appeal to each other. The PVP successfully in, in 2020 won votes from different ethnic groups, and it shows in a variety of ways. Forget about those of us who sit in cabinet who represent different ethnic groups. It would be unacceptable for the PPPC, uh, born under Chedi Jagan, to have a government that is one ethnic group. That would be impossible for the PPPC um, because that's not how we operate. The ethnic insecurities have come about by a variety of things, as I pointed out historically, and also by uh, uh, political leaders, particularly in the opposition, who uses ethnicity the calls that afro guyanese are victims, et cetera. But for five years, they were in government. Thousands of people lost their jobs. Contractors who were indo guyanese could not get work. And we pro produced that evidence when we were in opposition. And we fought our way back into government, not fight physically, of course. But now we're in government. Now we're in government. That's the proof of the pudding. What are our policies? Are they ethnic biased? Are, is there a state policy that says indo guyanese first, afro guyanese second? There's no such thing that is happening. We removed all the draconian taxes that were brought by Granger government, 250 of them that made life for working people, particularly poor people, afro guyanese and indo guyanese extraordinarily difficult. We, there were 30,000 people who lost their jobs during the five years that Granger was in government. We've had to try to create and to find jobs for people in terms of a number of social and, and economic programs. The procurement system was clogged up with the largest companies that supported and financed them. We've opened up, according to our laws, and our, that procurement is taking place at every community, every local authority, uh, region and the national levels and the ministries. Over 1,000 small uh, small uh, contractors, small businesses have been created to do work at the community level. We do not have stratified communities that are one ethnic group and the other. We have communities that may be, be a larger number of one ethnic group, but we don't have like in the 60s, uh, one village after another being stratified by ethnicity coming out of the violence of the 60s, 1960s. So a number of the ethnic programs, all the the relief programs of COVID and the as a result of the global economic and fuel crisis has been geared at reaching everyone. The COVID relief programs that went to every single household, the cash care programs that went to every single child registered in school, the, the housing programs where over 11,000 people have been able to have household, uh, house lots in the government national program of all different ethnic groups. And their their visuals, their newspapers, photographs of people getting their titles. We have the increases in salaries for the Ghana Defense Force and the police, the fire, who are majority Afro Guyanese. The public servants are just getting an eight percent, another increase of eight uh, percent. Again, that are majority Afro Guyanese. We have the recent announcement by the president to do with. Um, what you call graduated increases for doctors, nurses, and uh, allied health workers. This is, again, majority afro guyanese So the, the, the view that is being portrayed is totally incorrect. The housing programs exist in every single region 
of Guyana. And in every region, there are slightly different demographics to do with ethnicity. In regions, one, uh, interior regions, majority is Amerindian. On the coastal belt, you have certain regions that are majority Indo-Guyanese, others that are majority Afro-Guyanese. And so the ethnic insecurities have been whipped up historically by elements in the media who are hostile, as well as those who would like, I believe, and this is my belief, to keep Afro-Guyanese um, separated and to believe that they're victims and not to get involved in any of the, the programs of the government. For example, the president, we as, as Guyanese and politicians believe we can go into any community, talk to people, have meetings and so on. There's never been a view that you can't do that. Now, all of a sudden, you have uh, communities where the AP and UFC won the local government elections who are saying the president has to have permission to go into the community to look at whether they have roads or whether they have housing programs or health programs. This is unacceptable. This has never happened in our country before. In fact, the apartheid that they're trying to set up is what they're doing, not us. Um, so that there are elements, but luckily they're just a minority of those local authorities who are saying ministers can't come in here, president come and come in unless we approve, and we don't want any programs unless you know we we give our permission. And yet you have people from those communities writing us and saying, we need our road, we need our community center, we need a better school, and we're responding to that. How so, interesting. So it's a winner-take-all mentality then, and if we don't win... And you know... And you know that we're talking about one Guyana. So the whole concept of one Guyana is is philosophically very new. We've talked about one people, one nation, one destiny, but we've never talked about us as one Guyana. And how do you, that how do you make that happen then, Gail? Because again, you've got this extraordinary background over 30 years in politics and politics is the study of people. Actually, you, it's more than that, but I'm glad you keep it to 30. People think <laughs> I should say 15 years, Gail. 15 <laughs> years in, in politics. Don't go too far. Don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> Don't push it. But how, how do you do, how do you create that one Guyana vision? How do you ensure that every Asian society sees that and believes in that? When you said, as you rightly mentioned, that the media is almost underpinning this division. You've got political parties that are almost using people as fodder, as division in order to get vote harvesting in. And I've also experienced it myself when I was in Guyana under Granger's government. The comments that made to me by ministers were absolutely appalling. Economic progress was based upon the arbitrary factor of one's skin color rather than having a look at what the numbers were. Yeah, but let's not digress. How do you create a one Guyana, especially when things are more divided than before? You know, um, it is fortuitous that we have a young president, Irfan Ali. We had a great leader with Chedi. We've been very blessed as a country and as a party with Chedi Jagan, Janet Jagan, then Bar Jagdeo, Donald Ramata. Now we have Irfan Ali. And this is a young visionary leader. Our whole, you know, how do I, let me just try to summarize it. And that this is the first time as a country since independence that we as Guyanese, the majority of Guyanese, regardless of their ethnicity, think that there's hope for Ghana. This is our golden era. This is our golden era. We can make it or break it, depending on what we do as a people, as a nation. And so this whole attitude of Guyanese is interesting. And as you said, I've been around for a while. We have gone around the Caribbean sometimes feeling like second-class citizens. This is the first time Guyanese kind of hold their shoulders up, put their shoulders back, carry their chin up in the air, because we really have a sense of where our country is going, the transformation of our country. Um, the, and oil and gas gives us that opportunity that we would not have had before. But the whole position we've taken on low-carbon development strategy, the fact that we are uh, trading in carbon services, that we are one of the carbon sinks for the entire world, et cetera, et cetera. We are almost now recognizing who we are and what we have, and what we have to offer, not just Guyanese, but the world. So this whole concept of what we're doing on the international stage, what we're doing in regards to climate change, what we're doing with food security, again, regionally, um, all these big ticket issues, 
that Ghana said, oh, we're a small country, we're not very important to the world. There is a sense that, yes, we are important and we can have a voice and we can say things and we can carry ourselves in a certain way. And there are many challenges, as many other countries do. But one Guyana gives us an opportunity to, to do things, to be things. Um, we haven't worked it all out. Who can? There's no one who is, no philosopher who has sit down and read, this is how you guys are going to work this out. It's an embryo that is growing and is being fostered and, and helped. So the, the whole issue of the religious leaders being able um, to, to work together, to be able to have various religious festivals together, the whole issue of, of not accepting when the mayor of Georgetown says that the president wants to install a Muslim state in Guyana. The eruption yesterday when he said that um, was that the Christian churches, the um, private sector, the number of the Hindu organization said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you're not going to introduce into this country uh, religious intolerance. This is not how we've lived. And so it, it, they crossed the line. The whole area of men on mission, the whole idea of getting a thousand men to come out and say, we're against violence against women. And when you look around, it's men of all different colors, of all different positions. The, the whole idea of people working and helping to build houses, the programs that have to do with looking at the educational programs, the, the Guyana Online Academy, which has provided scholarships for people from certificate to, to master's with uh, universities that are German in uh, what you call in India, University of West Indies, majority of people are those who didn't are doing the certificate program, but it's opening doors and the majority of these people are women. So the whole, there's a lot going on both at economic, social, and there is a, how do you say, a thread that is weaving amongst them to say, we have a, a, a role to play and we can be one people, not just one people, but one Guyana. So we're not talking about that, you know, we are afro guyanese indo guyanese portuguese guyanese Chinese Guyanese, or Amerindian Guyanese. This is one Guyana and how do we fit into it and what do we want? And the whole idea of one democracy, rule of law, constitutional rule of law, our, our human rights, as well as socioeconomic development that benefits all the people and that we're able to raise people out of poverty and give them um, opportunities to be able to make their lives better. And so the whole concepts that have emerged of dream, dreams realized in the housing program, that majority of women who are single, because um, we have a lot of uh, fathers who don't support our mothers, um, who can own a, own a property. In fact, the the gender, the um, the gender equality forum, which put out his report, shows Ghana has very high ratings to do with women owning property, meaning land or house lot mainly. Um, and so, the country is on the move. We have not solved all our problems, but there's a mood in the country that we can, we can, we can change our lives. We can make Ghana a model um, of a developing country that is able. Uh, to to resolve the inequities in our society, the disparities in our society between urban and rural and, and hinterland, between uh, classes, between different religions or, or uh, gender issues and stuff like that. These are the big ticket issues and all the social programs are geared at access and equitable access to the programs. There is no program, there's no when the opposition talks about apartheid, I think it is just words that they're throwing around that are emotive because apartheid means institutionalized racism. Yep. And there's no institutionalized again. Well, there's no say, states what's, what's your racism. biggest fear, Gail, then? Because you've seen Guyana's progression over the years, and I know that this is a feeling that there's a new Guyana. And yes. if we were to take the politics aside for a moment, Every election comes in, it's always a new Guyana, it's a new start. Yes, we can. We've all heard the slogans before as well. 
On your side, what's your biggest fear? If things don't change, what could happen? Because we've seen large states, and again, for Guyana's example, from a 2 billion economy to a 22 billion economy because of oil. We've seen what's happening in places such as Angola, how all, rather than being a blessing, has almost become an increasing divide, not of that of ethnicity, but of class, as he mentioned before. Absolutely. Those who do and those who do not. And we've seen the same example worldwide. What are the fears going through your head? There are many fears that I have. I, um, one, there, there, there are exogenous issues we can't control. So, I mean, we, we don't operate in islands so we can determine everything ourselves. And so, you know, yes, there's oil and gas. There, there are issues of um, climate change. We have had almost all year rain when we're supposed to have seasons of dry and rain. This has caused tremendous impact on many communities. We have had to um, use billions and billions in dollars to repair infrastructure, to adapt infrastructure, to be able to reduce the impact of flooding. Uh, agriculture has been impacted on, uh, human lives are impacted on. And so the biggest issue that we have to deal with is climate change and unpre unprecedented weather patterns that really impact on us. So 2005 was mainly the coast. Now the flooding is taking place in the interior based on the rivers coming from the back of us, the Amazon, that are overflowing and flooding into Ghana and all head north, which is to the coast. So climate change, number one. Number two are the issues of global economy and the impact of inflation and, and uh, supplies, whether it's fuel or food or any other. And of course, the unpredictability of pandemics. We still haven't recovered from COVID. It costs us billions of dollars to try to address it as a nation and to protect our people, but it hasn't gone away. And all the predictions have to do with we are probably going to face more of these pandemics as the world progresses. So those are exogenous factors that we may be able to look at. And of course, one of the exogenous factors um, has to do with our border issues. We're before the world court with the issue Venezuela. of yeah. Venezuela. And so we choose a peaceful road. We have no big army. We have no big helicopters. We have no B-52 bombers. We have to choose the peaceful and legal road. That those are the exogenous issues. The internal issues then are correct in the terms of what are the challenges we face. We have been very careful to look at the experiences of other oil producing countries. You named Angola, for example, Chad, other countries. And so our programs we're using, we have very transparent legislation to do with how the revenues that we're getting from oil have to pass through parliament, has to be uh, gazetted, so that every time we get uh, revenues from oil, it's gazetted, it's public, it's announced, and then we go to parliament and look at what can be used. We've set up mechanisms to monitor and to decide on how the, the oil revenues to be used, which are made up of non-government members and government members. So the, there are mechanisms of framework set in place to deal with the sovereign welfare fund, or what we call our natural resource fund. The challenges, of course, is that Will the the will people believe and will people follow the opposition in terms of division and creating ethnic further ethnic insecurities or fears? Obviously, that becomes an issue. And we had the crime wave in Ghana in 2002, 2008 that we know was political. It was not just a bunch of really horrible, dangerous criminals, but who were also supported by a political agenda that said kith and, clin, kith and kin in regards to um, the persons who were leading the crime wave. Sorry, sorry, when it was, run me through that statement again. You said kith and clin. What does that mean? K-I-T-H yeah. and, and clin, meaning that they it's our own. It's it's it, what the, the government then, the former president said, Mr. Hoyt, was that the, the persons who were leading the crime wave were kith and kin and to stick with kith and kin meaning that you stick with your own and that the the crime leaders the the, the gangsters were called liberation movement and that created a period of terror in guyana between 2000 and 2008 if there's any period that was terror it was that period and so mm -hmm. would, would that be a possibility that that if the certain elements in the opposition who are radicalized and who feel that 
they cannot win through the ballot box as they couldn't in 2020 and try to distort and to steal the results and prevent us having uh, uh, the declaration for over five months. If that group were to have their way or to be able to, to, to create momentum, then obviously they're a threat to democracy, not just to the PPPC, they're a threat to democracy and they're a threat to the progress that our nation could make. At this point, they're not gathering uh, momentum. They're, they, they generally now, and the new leader opposition um, does not have the same weight or support as earlier opposition leaders. So um, they seem to be trying to create more an image internationally to hurt Guyana in regards to uh, well, the statements of apartheid, racism, because a racist we've, we've state. we've also seen Indian demonstrations state. in the streets in the US where people have been yes. calling out. And that, that's a big thing. And I suppose for you as a minister, but also as a person from Guyana, how do you digest that? Because on one side, it affects your public diplomacy, that the world is now looking at you through a very different vice. And the other yes. side, people are looking at you saying, well, are you part of a racialized institution? Yeah, it's it, it's it's not easy. Let's put it that way. It's <laughs> not easy personally. It's not easy personally because um, especially when, you know, I mean, we we cultivate friends. We cultivate friends at, at the government levels at we have friends in the and work our president and the CARICOM leaders with President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, for example. But you know, the the a lot of what is being said is to try to position the opposition to have support internationally, regionally, which they don't uh, have in Guyana. So they're trying to come at it at another level, which is what they've tried before during the crime wave. Um, by the accusations of race. The, the problem they face is this, and that's a reality, and it's hard to be able to explain that because it's a history. Indo-Guyanese, basically, and fundamentally, have been the victims of discrimination in Guyana. We know from colonialism, the discrimination against all ethnic groups that weren't white. The Portuguese that were brought from Madeira's indentured laborers were to be the buffer zone between the uh, white colonials and the, the non-white African and Indian workers. But we've the issue is that under the PNC reign from independence right through to 92, Indo-Guyanese were terribly victimized. They could not get job, jobs in the public service. They could not, uh, other than farming uh, and, and, and low jobs and, and the small businessmen and the business community was eventually killed by Burnham when they had uh, the economy was state controlled. 80% of the economy was controlled by the state between the 1970s and 1992. And so it's rather, um, how do you say, hard to, to swallow um, when we know even in Granger's tough, short five years in government, they, they fired thousands of public servants. Majority were Indo-Guyanese and Afro-Guyanese who dared to support the PPP, to be known to be PPP. So the level of discrimination that is there, we have facts on that, but we can't live in that. We can't con constantly be talking about what they did to us from 1966 to 92. The, the number of people who emigrated to London and to Canada, our people are scattered throughout the world. Um, mainly because of, of political and ethnic issues. And so we can't we can't live in that era all the time. But when we are accused, then we have to answer. And so we don't want to live in that world where where you know you're dealing with the ethnic issue as if it is the number one issue in Ghana. It is not the number one issue. Number one issue is ensuring that our people have access to health services, to education, to jobs, to businesses, to be our children have a opportunity to be able to go to get trained in university, etc., and an opportunity for us to create new uh, economic and other opportunities for people, including investors, etc. But we, the idea of us looking at everything from an ethnic eye, <clears throat> can be very debilitating in terms of second guessing everything we do. They accuse us of 
Indo-Guyanese contractors are dominating and, and Afro-Guyanese contractors are marginalized. First of all, this is again catchphrases because our procurement laws, and they're the most advanced in the Caribbean, state very clearly you have to go to tender. Here is the criteria you have to have, which is there by law and by regulations. The fact that when, when you go to tender, it comes down, there's an evaluation committee. The evaluation committee makes the recommendations. The evaluation so you're committee all, all comes, the due process the is there. Service. That, that exactly. is evidence, evidence based. And so I mean no one has no one is sitting there and saying, well, this Indian company must get this job and this Indian company. That's absurd. It has to do with a procurement process that is transparent and the Auditor General is there, checks is it. Is there the issue you know, trust then, I guess? Because if you're saying this is what happened with the previous administration, and uh, I think he was an army, he was part of the army, David Granger, and that there's yes. so much mistrust at that time and pre those eras, why would the general public now, after so many years of mistrust, of having their votes have been placed and obviously going to the wrong hands, now trust a new administration with a younger head of state, because that's quite a hard pill to swallow. You know, bite me once, okay, fine. If you bite me twice, I'm going to be equally shy, but three or four times, man, I must be suicidal if I'm going to put my faith into a government. How do you overcome that issue? How do you make sure then, as a government that is going for one Guyana, that people genuinely trust you, that goes beyond just the policies, but also look at the optics that people feel inclusive in where the country is heading? Yeah, well, I mean, clearly, the issue of trust and confidence and building it is a, a major issue. And that has to do with how we run our bureaucracy, how the constitutional bodies are run, where people have trust that they are open and free from interference, etc., as well as delivering as a government. If we promise communities we're going to do their roads, we deliver. Over a thousand roads are being built right now and bridges in communities. Um, for example, thousands of houses being built. But but the thing is that we've gone through from, from 68 elections to 92 with rigged elections, which were publicly, globally, internationally known, and no one can deny that. From 92 to 2015, we have had elections that were observed by international observers. We've had court cases in which the results of elections were not challenged by the international observers nor by the courts. And then we have the 2020 elections, which saw litigation going crazy in the courts all the way up to the Caribbean Court of Justice. So one is that there's been no accusation. There's no, nobody believes that the PVP went and rigged elections between 92 and now. What people have been concerned about is those who feel they're afraid in terms of what happens after elections, uh, in terms of the results. The, we have a big task to, to build the trust and confidence. You're absolutely correct in, in that Guyanese of all ethnic groups, because we can become cynical. Our people have, in many cases, become cynical. And so when you go to some Armenian communities, because for five years, no ministers went to see them under Granger, and you go now to talk about their problems, they say, well, you know, how do we trust you? How come you're different? How are you different than the guys before? And so that that pressure, which the president is very cognizant of, that what we promise, what we say we'll deliver, we have to deliver. And so the whole diplo diplomatic corps in Guyana knows that the government is running at a tremendous speed as never before to try and get projects done, to make our deliver our promises and to make legislative changes that would be able to make business easier, life easier for our people. And so part of that building trust too, was to have consultations on electoral laws that needed to be reformed to prevent ever again, <laughs> something like that would happen in March, just, 2020 just, with just that that elections Kale, officials taking over. With what happened in March, 2020, obviously it sounds like something illegal took place. Is that correct? Yes. So why have there not been any arrests? Oh, they caught. They, <laughs> um, again, you talk about, you know, so we have many elephants in the room that the opposition doesn't like to talk about. But the, you know, just remember I talked earlier about her election petition that was put in in 2015, after yeah. the 2015 election, that has not been heard up to now. 
2020, after the 2020 elections, criminal charges have been brought against the uh, senior officials of the Ghana Elections Commission who were involved in one, trying to prevent the statements of poll being used and even when the recount was done, refusing to use the recount figures to bring to the chairperson and the commission to adopt. So there are a series of people who are before the courts and been charged and are before the courts, including uh, persons in the machinery that interfered with the database of the voters, including other staff. So those have gone before the court. The cases, most of the cases, not even started being heard. There are persons in the leadership of the AP and UFC who are involved. They have been charged there before the courts. We have a commission of inquiry right now going on with jurists that are uh, two jurists from overseas, one from Guyana, that are holding a commission inquiry into what happened in the March 2020 elections. The evidence that is there, and they have live stream hearings of the persons giving evidence of what happened from March the 2nd onwards. And so there, there are many revelations, even for those of us who were involved in the March 2020 elections, there's certain revelations coming out that even we didn't know about. So persons have been charged, they're before the courts. There are many persons also charged to do with corruption that are before the courts and many of the cases are not being heard as yet. So we are, we, we are prepared to, to deal with those issues, but we need to have, ju justice must be timely and must not be delayed. But surely timely is not two years on heading towards a third year. It's, um, I suppose that, that counts for a lot of trust within. Gail, I have had you on for over 50 minutes now. So it's been a really good, good conversation. We all got a feeling that this is first of many more to come on. Just before we end the podcast, and what would you like to leave our audience around the globe about Guyana? Because obviously we're dealing with the biggest misconceptions there. What would you like to leave them in their mindset? I would like to to say that that our this view that our people are divided probably the only time that some of those divisions or come about is elections or post elections more than elections so pre elections and post elections but we are a people that are very special we live in a country that's very blessed with resources that many countries would wish to have and that uh, we are, we have a we are developing a tourist industry that is based on adventure and ecotourism and therefore we hope that you will consider coming to visit and to meet our people we're very warm and hospitable and we love to show off how we can cook and the different diet different uh, cultures we can show to you so we have a long struggle we have a long struggle democracy has been our number one fight during all the rigged elections, building democracy has been our number one fight when we've been in government. And protecting and building and preserving democracy is still our number one fight. And so no matter what we have as Guyanese, democracy is the overarching issue, that once we have democracy, these, whether they're allegations or realities, can be addressed with an, a constitutional rule of law framework and not in terms of um, anarchistic or um, violent uh, means. So I'm, I'm thinking out loud, Gail. I know a lot of people will be <clears throat> curious to know which sides of the stories are the right side, because we've had yourself on, we've had obviously Timothy Jonas on, and many other people from Guyana. I think we had Jarendas, the person who did the vote in No Confidence, many, many months yes. ago. Yes. Would the government of Guyana be open enough to allow the team from the Global Indian Series to come in to see for ourselves with our own eyes, with our own ears, and experience it to see what Guyana truly is about? Personally, I say welcome, but I'm not like I'm not in charge of that sector, so I leave it to my colleague minister. But we are not uh, fearful of what we are doing. Uh, we are not fearful that. Um, that if what I'm saying, when you come, you'll find a different story. You'll see the country on the move, coming from the lowest place it was in 92. 92, we were the poorest country in this region with the highest level of poverty of 61%. We were just a smidge above Haiti. 
and we struggle with the high we have the highest in debt per capita we have come a long way through a very difficult sometimes good bad ugly times and we have been able to rise as a people and as a nation and we will continue to do that so we have been innovative in our in our solutions we have sometimes not always agreed with the financial institutions on their models but we've been able to come up with very innovative solutions to some of our problems and those are ones that we and there are other issues we still have to confront but i think that um guyana is very unique and and i think it is worth um coming and seeing people ourselves. looking at it Absolutely. in a different way Absolutely, Gail. It's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for giving me so much time. I really appreciate it. And You're sorry welcome. I can't bring you some sunshine from Guyana, but <laughs> all the best to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for